woman. All right. So we're all connected, and 123 artists have put together the most raw, gorgeous, important, incredible exhibition, one of the greats that we've had at the Sackler Center at the Brooklyn Museum. I want to thank all 123 artists, and I would like to ask Cecilia and Andrea. Andrea, where are you? Cecilia, please, to stand. These are our curators, Cecilia Fahard Hill and Ma Andrea Cuento. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Connie Butler. I don't know if Connie is here. And Ann Philbin at the uh, Hammer Museum where the show opened. And we're, we are now its next and very happy venue. I want to thank the Ford Foundation because the Ford Foundation was our lead sponsor. And of course, we love our lead sponsors. But also, we have our Brooklyn Museum trustee, Cecilia Picon. And I don't know if she is here, but Cecilia, Thank you very much for your support of this exhibition. Starry Night, Goldsmith Foundation, Bank of America, and this one is great, Brooklyn Friends of Radical Women. Everybody thank you. Yeah, we have to be very grateful to those sponsors. Catherine Morris is our Sackler Senior Curator of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And Catherine, you are a dream curator. You are my dream curator. You are this museum's dream curator. And you have brought us radical shows year after year after year since you have been here. You have changed art and you have changed museums in this borough, in this city, in this state, in this nation in this world, and I want you to stand up so we can all thank you for being a very, very great curator. Come stand up, Catherine. She is incredibly modest, incredibly brilliant, um, and incredibly fun to work with, and I suspect a lot of you are here who are here know that that is the case, and of course we are here standing on the shoulders of our radical Latina women artists from 1960 to 1985. They have persevered, they have been tenacious, they took risks. And to have you here at the Brooklyn Museum is an honor for us, and I hope that you recognize your achievements, even though it was so many decades in the making. As an Ameri a Native American friend of mine said, Great things take a very long time to make. So let us know that you are appreciated and that indeed what comes after you is going to come because of what you have done. We look forward to hearing from many of you uh, this afternoon. It's going to be a terrific symposium and I'd like to invite Catherine Morris, whom I have given great accolades to, and Carmen Herrera, whom I adore, who also is part of the deadly duo, to join me on stage, and they are going to take it away. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all for being here. Um, Carmen and I are thrilled to be on this stage to um, welcome you and to start this wonderful afternoon. Um, I'd like to start, we'd like to start, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which the Brooklyn Museum was established in 1823 is the ancestral territory of the Canarsie tribe of the Lenape people. Um, we would also like to acknowledge all of the artists in the room, the curators, and get started really quickly on this. I would just like to say, as Elizabeth pointed out, this show to this point has been driven by a remarkable group of women, women artists, women curators, women trustees, women directors in two museums that are, fun, that are led by women bo board members. It is a group of women that have driven this entire project from its inception, and we're particularly proud of that. And I'm Carmen Armo. Hi, everyone. 
So excited to be here, so excited for this great afternoon. We had a wonderful experience with Andrea and Cecilia during the installation process. If you've been up to the galleries, you'll know this is a big show, 123 artists, almost 300 artworks. This is a very complex undertaking and it went beautifully and the show looks fantastic. We need to shout out Ali Ricard and Kate Wonderlich for their amazing work in the installation. And the amazing energy, of course, that the artists brought to the opening on Thursday night for our members, friends, artists, family, VIP, everyone. I've never seen the museum so excited, so buzzing, so happy, and that's because of you all. And of course, today, the excitement continues with this afternoon. We'd love to shout out Margot Cohen, Risa Rucci, Andy Hawks, Lauren Zelaya, everyone who um, contributed to this amazing program. Um, but really, it's my pleasure to introduce Drs. Cecilia Farajardo Hill and Dr. Andre Junta. Um, it's been such an honor to work with them. They were incredible in the installation. They know how to party. The book is fantastic. They've orchestrated this amazing scholarly endeavor. Those of you who've seen the show know it's thematically based, so there's so much richness and experience in the artwork, the way they've organized it. But the book itself is going to stand long after the exhibition. It's total feat of scholarship and shows the work, the love, the passion that these two incredible women have put into this incredible exhibition. So without further ado, I welcome Andrea and Cecilia to the stage. Well, this is a wonderful day, and um, the symposiums in this event that happen after the big celebrations are great because they bring together the knowledge, the conversation, the exhibition. It is a kind of a great moment of intersection. Um, well, just a very, very quick introduction of this project. Some of you have heard it before, but this is a project that took uh, nearly eight years to, to be produced. During the first four years, there was a huge opposition to the project. And I know because of that, as a woman, that women, artists, women have a very hard time and women in general have a hard time still today, even though we were told repeatedly in a very patronizing way that women were in fashion, which was absolutely not true and continues not to be true. But uh, it all said, you know, this bad idea became this incredible exhibition that um, because of the reception we had at the Hammer, and I hope the reception that we'll receive here at the Brooklyn, actually people are interested in looking at the work of women artists. And for us, this is a chapter of art history, an unknown chapter of art history, which shows how a group of important women, in this case here at the Brooklyn Museum is 123, um, some of them are groups, but uh, contributed to how we understand contemporary art today. And it's very important for us as art historian to do a work where you actually unearth and produce histories that somehow readdress and creates a sort of a sense of justice. For me, it's hugely important to understand and for the future generations that that history cannot be written only on one side. Many of these women in their own lives, when they were actually participating, they were part of very exciting art scenes. Some of them were never really recognized and they had an incredibly hard time and they still persisted. And still today, for me personally, I've met some of the most amazing women and inspiring women that I would ever meet. Some of them are teaching, some of them are still practicing, but all of them have fiery eyes. They're still angry and they're still powerful. They're still challenging. And I think for me, this resilience of humanity and creativity is incredibly important. So, and so this exhibition for us is, a, is, is an art historical project, is a curatorial project, is a human endeavor, and it's wonderful to be able to share this with the Brooklyn Museum. I've said it before, it's telling that it happened at the Harvard Museum where there is a um, female director who is a feminist, a chief curator who is a feminist, that we have Catherine Morris, we have Elizabeth Sackler, the Elizabeth Sackler Center, we have a woman director, so it still takes many, many women to make a women's exhibition such as this happening. But also we need to remember that when half of the population is being oppressed, half of the art system is being oppressed because the average of representation of women, generally speaking, in museum is 15%. So in reality, you are oppressing half of the actual production of artists. And this should concern everybody. If you have oppressing the other person that is actually next to you, who is part of you, who is your mother, your sister, your friend, your girlfriend, your wife, or whoever you, are, you wanted to be, or your daughter, then it, there is a problem in society. And also the other thing I wanted to say before passing the word to Andrea is this is an exhibition which is a conversation between Latin American, Latina, and Chicana artists. It's very important to stress this dialogue. For me, 
these are, there are shared sensibility, there is more shared political histories and experimental history, creative histories than the rest. So to keep this field separated, to kill th this idea that there is a kind of a segregation of areas of culture is not like that. This is an exhibition that shows how we share a sensibility and this sensibility is also shared in a wider context with the universal art. So keep in mind that this is not a niche, this is not a niche idea of radical women, this is about contemporary art, this is about a powerful uh, contribution and standing about meaningful art, something that is human and political and brave. Well, uh, I want to say that I learned a lot uh, through these eight years working together. I want to thank Cecilia because uh, we were really working from different, we didn't know even before, I think. And it was, uh, she was planning to do an exhibition. She read an article I wrote, then she called me, then we began all this crazy project that we are married together for eight years already. <laughs> We did okay. Um, I really want to say that uh, this ex exhibition transformed me. I also thought that women had been recognized. I was working very much with theory, with gender studies, you know, problematizing the ways of conceptualized gender, and it was okay. But uh, when we were planning this exhibition, it was so much resisted by the most cutting edge curators, my friends, my colleagues, telling us that it was not necessary, that we may have all been already uh, recognized, and why we are not introducing a man. Then I thought, well, why we should introduce a man? You know, if you are making an exhibition of German art, nobody will ask you why you are not introducing a French. Then uh, I thought, well, <laughs> this is completely ridiculous. Uh, but I was aware that it was something traumatic there. And then when it's something traumatic, when something is so resisted, it's because it needs to be down. And then this makes us to be more sure and not to have doubt about the exhibition. Works were amazing, we were convinced that it was a necessary exhibition and it was a political action, also an aesthetic action, and uh, uh, that it was very necessary. It transformed me because I was this kind of people, you know, I say with respect, that think, well, I am a woman that I never feel myself oppressed. But we should not generalize our own feelings. We should be able to observe the society and to understand that maybe we are being patriarchal also in the way we talk, in the way we use our concepts. Then this exhibition uh, transformed me, um, make me be part of a important feminist movement in Argentina and to be aware of how important it is to work together to work for what is making us to be together on, and not for what make us to be different. Then I think that this exhibition, as uh, two artists uh, said to Cecilia and me, Liliana, Faja, um, Liliana Porter and Anna Tiscornia, is like a forum and as a chorus. In me, it means you can listen all the voices and they have something to say. It's a forum, it's a place for expression. And I am very happy that we were able to create together with the artists, together with all the staff, friends and colleagues, women that were working at the Hammer and at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, as we said, it's an army of women making this exhibition possible, uh, that this is happening. Many of these artists were completely erased, not just in the States, institutions, in American institutions, but also in their own country. It was very difficult for us to arrive to the different countries to make research and to find colleagues that were telling us, no, they are not more important artists. No, they are not. And then we have to do research and to go into the archives, then recover these voices and to bring here to the space of exhibition. Then I am incredible, happy that we were able to do it. Yeah, and just to finish, um, this, 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 this,
Like okay, so, months, yeah, so now uh, we are calling to the stage Josely Carvalho, who is one of the radical women in the exhibition. We have a special commemoration happening now, and is, uh, it begins with Jocelyn's, and then it will continue with all of us. Uh, we, all radical women, are doing an action in remembrance and protest of thousands of women murdered because of their political activism and involvement with social justice. I would like to start it with Marielle Franco, a Brazilian politician, sociologist, feminist, human rights activist, exterminated, was not only killed on March 14, 2018. And nobody has found it yet the killers, as we spoke a little about paramilitary, but they will never appear and I doubt we will ever know. And I think this is a very important action because uh, this is interferes with the whole political process in Brazil. Hi everyone and welcome. I want to thank you all for making it here today. My name is Justin Donez and I'm a museum apprentice here at the Brooklyn Museum. <laughs> Being an artist born and raised in Brooklyn, it's such an amazing opportunity to be introducing such an inspirational and powerful Latin American artist. Our first panel artist, Cecilia Bucuña, was born in Santiago, Chile, and raised to a family of artists and writers. Eventually majoring in fine arts at the University of Chile, she has explored many different forms of art creation, including but not limited to abstract, poetry, and the precarious. She has displayed that with grit and imagination, expression and achievement can be accomplished in any form. In turn, dreams will come be become a reality. To me, she's such an inspiration in showing there's no requirements to create art. Whether your material is paint, debris, or a pen, create what you love. Let's hear it for Cecilia Vicuña, who will be in conversation with Catherine Morris, Sackler Senior Curator for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center 
for feminist art here at the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you. Welcome. Gracias. Whenever I see Cecilia, I just want to look at her and smile. Um, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak with you today. And um, since we're the first speakers, announced sort of leading off the day, I thought we could start with, with two important terms relating to this exhibition, one of which appears in the title of the show, the other does not. The one word is radical, and the other word is feminism. And um, I would love to hear your thoughts about how both of those terms apply to you personally, but also in relationship to your work. Okay, since we have just come from a sea of death, acknowledging the continuous murder of the women, and I would like to speak of another form of death that patriarchal culture has created around the world for the last 5,000 years, really, at least, which is the killing of language and the reduction of language to sort of a minimal expression. The word radical, of course, hides a root. And so uh, every human being is rooted to the mystery of life itself. And so to be radical really means to remember the root, the root in the inextricable it's inextricable union between life and death. So that is what my work is about. It's about a complete awareness of death, which means a complete awareness of life. And femme, femme, you probably know that that root, femme, means really tit, tit. And if you think of it that way, you begin to see the incredible beauty in that root. Yet, in the world that we live in, it means a put down. To be feminine is to be ridiculous. To be a feminist, it means to be inconvenient and inappropriate. And everything negative and destructive is associated to that tit. Think of what that implies. Why is this fear and hatred of the fluids in the body of the woman? When you look at the exhibition upstairs, you see a lot of fluid. It's everywhere, it's pouring down, practically every art. is pouring inside of us and moving inside of us. And I think that's the energy that brings thousands of people in because of the denial of the life force. The teeth the milk is really associated to the Milky Way. The milk has been flowing for millions of years in all mammals, and hopefully it will continue to flow. And the other unmentionable fluid, which is just as powerful, is the menstrual blood. So I have just published a book in Berlin, which I published with Documenta, which tells the story of how this little red thread has run my life and how it has become kipus, how it has become really uh, the, the notion that this menstruation relates the human body, especially the body of the woman, to the cosmos, to the cycle of the life of the planets and the stars and the cycles of the moon. So to despise menstruation, is to despise our cosmic dimension. And the cosmic dimension really means the scale of the imagination, the unbound imagination of humans. Oh, it's very hard to follow up on this. <laughs> Tell me when you became a feminist. The first time I was a little girl, maybe not so little, but still little, um, uh, in the 60s, I think that's when I first saw this image, oh, women are burning brass, and they are called themselves feminists. Fuck, that 
is absolutely fantastic. So I became instantaneously a feminist <laughs> because <laughs> up to that moment, for example, I experienced the same that every woman that is in this room experienced. I know, for example, I remember when I was born. When I was born, my mother cried because she had not produced a male. I know the nurses that received me on that very cold day in Santiago de Chile. Oh, a girl, you know? So that girl, oh, that followed me throughout my life. So the burning of the bra really meant the end of that and the complete liberation of who you really are. Cecilia, those nurses had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we have some, some of your work um, on the screen here and, and just even your introduction talking about women and fluids and, and thinking about your work in terms of scale. You have moved throughout your career between picking up small pieces of floatsam and jetsam and making imaginary objects that are not meant to survive. And you've also dealt with the incredible scale of imagination, which you have referred to um, as encompassing the cosmos. So could you tell us a little bit about how you move back and forth between these two extraordinary kinds of proportional propositions? Mm. Yes, uh, I think this relates completely to the indigenous uh, understanding of uh, being uh, in a multidimensional state. In other words, the understanding that awareness is shared by every living thing. My art began in Konkon, which is pictured there on that place. And Konkon uh, means uh, water, water, or it means consciousness, consciousness, or it means the sweet water and the salty water. It really means the cycle of life and death. Konkon is the name of the, one of the most ancient deities of the Andes, even though nobody now living in Konkon knows this because all this information, all this knowledge of indigenous peoples has been suppressed. But because I am half an Indian, I'm a mestizo, somehow this knowledge was available to me from the land itself. So one day I am in Konkon, I am a teenager, and suddenly I became aware of the awareness around me. So the scale of the totality of that awareness was boundless, as I was saying, because the sea was aware, the wind, the light, everything was aware. And I, this tiny thing, smaller than a grain of sand, was also aware. So the infinite scale and the tiny scale were one for an instant. And that is what allowed me to do little pieces of almost invisible works that high tide would erase and also monumental works that can take up half a city or half a town or a big museum. So for me, there's uh, the possibility. It's just there and a scale is for us to play with. So the other way that I imagine scale and multiple voices and a kind of um, embrace of thinking about the cosmic level of so many of your approaches to your work also includes words. Your work in, is included upstairs in the section of the exhibition, The Power of Words, and obviously your work in poetry and your enormous study of the kipu and other um, subjects. I wonder if you could talk about how you see words functioning in relationship to the visual art that you also make. Right, that is really um, one of the weirdest things in the world because uh, how did uh, sound become uh, sound and silence? How did they become uh, an alphabet or a kipu? It's really impossible for us to even put ourselves in the place of the first peoples who imagined that. And how it would make sense to millions and millions of people. When in, in reality, uh, the way I think of it is uh, when you speak a word, it is as if the sound was allow allowing you to see an image. So something that is already embedded in our brains makes that crossing, that crossing of perceptual fields 
that at the same time that can be united, you are completely aware that they are different. So it's the ability to be in that double space that makes us human, and that's why a computer will never be able to match us. And the idea that artificial intelligence would somehow supersede us as the powers would like us to believe is 100% bullshit, because when is artificial intelligence going to be able to be simultaneously in so many states of consciousness, you know? I love being on the stage with this woman. <laughs> um, so, but take, let's talk politics. Let's talk about a very specific event that relates to liquid and milk that, that you've just talked about in a sort of metaphysical sense. But this piece is involved in a very specific political action as well, and I wonder if you could tell us a little about that. Yeah, um, the, the brutality with which um, we are treating the, the planet and each other seems to be increasing all the time. But in the 70s, uh, that was the first, uh, at least for my generation, that was the first encounter with uh, uh, unbound brutality as it happened in the military coup in Chile on September 11, 1973. I was in exile in Bogota in the 70s at the time, and I adore Bogota. I arrived there to be there for maybe a month or so, and I ended up staying for almost five years. But um, the enchantment of Bogota was that the people had never yet been uh, to, to be submissive. And when the milk crime, which was happening, whereby uh, you see, uh, because the, the ruling powers in Latin America uh, are in adoration of profit, everything goes, you know, everything, every form of corruption, every form of killing, everything is fine as long as there is gain. Of course, this is what people have been trained to believe. And so these people were buying milk, adding paint, and powders, and then sealing again the bags of milk and selling them as milk. So uh, almost 2,000 kids had died and nobody was taking action about that milk crime. And the papers were full of articles about the milk crime written by the Hermanos Caicedo, who I honor by naming them, because otherwise I would never have known. So I got an invitation from the CADA group in Chile to join them in their first action when they uh, found, uh, founded themselves with the invention of a name. Uh, uh, and they say, Cecilia, we're going to do a work called Para no morir de hambre en el arte, not to die of hunger in art, and we are going to be distributing milk. And they knew nothing about uh, what was happening in Bogota, so I answered immediately, said, yes, okay, I'm going to do something. So I filled up the city of Bogota with these posters uh, that were uh, done by the people who announced the, the Plaza de Toros, how you call that, the, the bullfights. And so I announced I would be spilling a glass of milk under the blue sky. And those who know Bogota know that at the time, Bogota was always cloudy. And so nevertheless, the sun read the posters and came out. And so the sun came out and 12 people came to the appointed place in front of the Quinta de Bolivar, and all I did was, as it looks there, I spilled a glass of milk, which of course was not milk. With a red thread. That's right. And I wrote a poem that is not here, but I believe is in the, is in, is in the wall, and the poem says, if I can remember it, something like, um, uh, what are we doing with life? And the question is embedded in the red thread because you see, again, the fluids, the milk and the blood are always in dialogue. Maybe you could describe what the kipu is in the history of that for the audience members who perhaps don't know. Okay, kipu means not in Quechua, and the Andean people devised more than 5,000 years ago a system of communication which consisted not of an alphabet, but of tying knots and knotting them. 
And these knots were so complex that they had uh, as many iterations and uh, transfigurations possible as the alphabet. That is to say, they could transmit very complex information, not just numbers, statistics, but also narratives. And so I came across the concept of the kipu when I was a teenager, and I immediately conceived of the fact that kipu had been destroyed, disappeared, persecuted by the church, um, and had been banned, and the people who knew how to read and write the kipu all murdered. So um, my first kipu was just a mind idea. It was called el kipu que no recuerda nada the kipu that remembers nothing. That was in the 60s. And so, um, soon enough, a few years after that, I think it was after the military coup, that the notion of this erased knowledge that had been extracted from us, as you extract, you remember that um, novel that was called The Extraction of the Stone of Madness by, of course, a woman. And so uh, we had been deprived of the knowledge of the kipu. So I began to speak in kipus as a way of uh, declaring my desire for memory, a memory that was not there. So it's this desire to remember what in actuality you have to invent as you go. So my kipus are really inventions and transformations. The connection for me of that knot on that glass and pulling the milk over feels very connected to the ideas that you talk about in relationship to um, sharing um, history, a shared experience. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to mention is that as a curator who often works in art of the 60s and 70s. I'm very interested in conceptual art. That's where I've done a lot of my curatorial practice. One thing that happens a lot when I call an artist and say, I'd love to talk to you about this piece you made in 1978. Um, the response I often get is, do you want to see what I'm doing now? Do you want to come to my studio? And it's a very important point that in relationship to this exhibition in particular, when we're talking about a history that has been um, excised or a history that has not been addressed or a history that um, perhaps has been um, deliberately kept quiet. Um, it was important for me in thinking about this exhibition coming to the Brooklyn Museum to acknowledge that many, most of the artists in this exhibition are still active practitioners of their work are still actively part of making important um, comments and work engaged in the art world today. And so in thinking about how we might in some small way make that point, um, Cecilia and I have, and along with the MFA Boston, have been working on a project so that next month we will be installing um, one of Cecilia's large-scale kipu um, works in our first floor. So. Um, again, that was an idea that really grew from wanting to support the contemporary practices of all of the artists in this show in a sort of gesture that would allow for that. Um, so this takes us back then perhaps to obviously the scale of the kipu and the question we had. And um, as I mentioned, one of the things that you talk about is the scale of the imagination, particularly in the kipu of the Andean imagination, you said. So maybe could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, one of the little known factors, I mean, everything about the kipu is really unknown, but the most unknown factor is that the kipu is not just a tactile object. The kipu also had a virtual dimension during Inca times. They had the concept called seke, which means a straight line. And so they had an imaginary kipu that spread out in 41 directions from Cusco, which was the core, the umbilicus, of the entire universe. I don't like to call it empire because that's a Western term, but the, empire, the Inca universe had uh, an umbilicus and how you call it? A belly, a belly button. A belly button. <laughs> it's hard to say belly button. Um, <laughs> this was Cusco. And it spread in every direction all the way into the galaxies, which are regarded 
as the source of life and the source of water all the way into the top of the mountains from where the water comes that will allow people to exist. And it involves a sort of reading and organization of all the ritual, practical, economical, social activities of the communities in regards to the care of the land and the responsibility for the care of the fluidity of the waters, among other things. So when I understood that the Incas thought of themselves like all of them were one kipu, and somehow that translated in my work to the performance ritual activity of the kipu, where I have been weaving people for three decades, perhaps, or more, with that concept, because indigenous, why are the indigenous being persecuted all over the world now, massacred in the most beautiful way from the perspective of the killers, and the most horrendous way from the perspective of the people murdered, is because they have an ability that they see themselves as individuals and see themselves as one. And that is a really powerful political dimension. And so my kipu here in Brooklyn Museum is going to be called El Kipu Desaparecido, the disappeared kipu, will refer exactly to that concept. And it will have the two dimensions of a textile object and a ritual performance to remind our bodies and our connectivity to come alive for political action. And so the title links us back to the earlier period, this, this, uh, this direct um, conversation with the political reality of the disappeared across so many countries. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about, I want to sort of go back to the notion of radicality and in the way that it operates in this exhibition. Um, can you tell us maybe if you have thoughts about the way that this exhibition functions for the artists in this show? in the history of art, because there hasn't been an exhibition like this before? Do you feel that um, its presence now, could you tell us a little bit about the impact that's had, or your thoughts about how it sort of plays out in the larger art world, which you're obviously also a part of? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I completely share the words that Cecilia Fajardo and Andrea Junta expressed, that uh, each one of us has been erased wildly brutally uh, for 50 years. I have been doing what I do for 50 years. And last year when I was in Documenta um, doing a kipu, a lot of people in Chile, who is this Cecilia Vicuña? Who's ever heard of this Cecilia? It was like a sort of um, something outrageous that I would be there instead of the big stars of the Chilean art scene. And I am sure that most of the women <laughs> this show have had very similar experiences. So the radical thing is to see yourself in your own way. To see and liberate who you really are. And so that radical gesture when it's done collectively as it's been done here becomes extremely powerful. And people feel it. It's like an animal thing. I remember when you open in Los Angeles there was a line of people going around the block, probably, I don't know for how many coils, like a serpent, of people who still wanted to get in and couldn't get in because there were so many people. What are these people attracted to? Is the revelation? Is to the fluids? Is what? You see, it's the fact that this suppressed being, and this suppressed knowledge, fun, sex, eroticism, he wants out. <laughs> there are so many works, it's very hard not to see them all. So I invite you to come many times so that you can slowly discover so many hidden things in the show, even though they are there to be seen. And one of them is this work, it's a performance that I did, um, I believe it was 1970 where it was the early period when fruits were being sold in a little a net. And so I grabbed one of those, they don't exist anymore, they were made of thread. 
and so they were very elastic. So I put one of those threads in my head and I told my boyfriend then, uh, we're going to play a game where I am going to be a fruit and you're going to eat me. He liked that game. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, we're going to play a game where I am going to become un regalo to you so you can do as you please with me. And so he liked that. But then I said, then you are going to become my gift and I'm going to do as I please with you. He didn't like that. But I did it both ways. So what you see in the work is the both ways. Is the reciprocation that, you know, that is so basic. If you look at the monkey society, the monkey society is based on the ethos of the reciprocal action. That is to say, if you do something, you need to receive and give back in terms that are equal or balanced as mutually accepted. So that principle is beyond equality, is about involving the mutual perception in a sort of acknowledgement of the other's desire. And I thought when Cecilia and Andrea invited me to recreate or do any kind of performance, and I did this for Los Angeles, uh, I thought of recreating that principle and transform into a collective performance where we wove each other. Uh, and it was absolutely beautiful to do that. I think that's a wonderful place to end. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Thank you. There's a lot of you here. So, welcome all to the opening of Radical Women Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985. My name is Teresa Juarez Moran from the Teen Night Planning Committee. And Before I go on, I would like to tell you all a little about myself. I am the middle child of Mexican immigrants, born here in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm studying digital illustration in digital arts and cinema technology high school. But enough of that. It's an honor to be introducing two wonderful women who are incredibly accomplished and of Latin American descent to you this afternoon. Barbara Carrasco. A, Ma a Mexican artist born in El Paso, Texas, who has been deeply devoted regarding her role in Chicano civil rights and has recently been able to showcase a mural of hers named LA History, a Mexican perspective that depicts the reality for the lives of people of color and their struggle, something that Ms. Carrasco felt the history textbooks re avoided revealing. Unfortunately, it was a heavily censored piece dealing with a lot of controversy at the time, but now it is showcased in the Natural History Museum, viewed by more than thousands on a daily basis. Let's hear it from Ms. Carrasco. <laughs> Our second guest is Janet Torro, a visual artist who was previously focused on pa painting while at the University of Chile, the country she was born. However, this changed once her uncle disappeared during the dictatorship of Pinochet, prompting her to change from painting to performance using her own body as the canvas. Nowadays, her artwork is displayed in public areas for all to see. One of these performances is El Cuerpo de la Memoria, where she depicts social reality when words just don't feel like enough. A round of applause for Ms. Carrasco and Ms. Toro in conversation with Cecilia Fajardo Hill, co-curator of Radical Women, Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985. Okay, this is the second session. It was a wonderful beginning with Cecilia. Whenever I see the exhibition or talk to the public about the show, I always tell them that the exhibition contains 123 radical ideas about art. We just heard about one, we're going to hear about two more. There's so many more views. One of the um, exciting things for me to actually chair 
this small conversation is to bring together a Chicana and a Chilean artist. Because for me, it's incredibly important that the exhibition is, brings alive this conversation, this kind of America's global South perspective on what sort of struggles and experiments and art was produced in our continent, not just think of Latin America or so forth. So, um, so the introduction to the artist was amazing, but I just wanted to stress that Barbara Carrasco is a Chicana artist born in El Paso. And what is incredibly powerful for me about her practice is the fact that she was involved in a very powerful uh, way with the United Farm Workers of America, was a very close person to Cesar Chavez, who is a powerful and absolutely crucial figure of the history of America and the rights of the Chicano and Latino people. So she's, all her work has been always uh, informed by a political vision and also by trying to kind of reveal kind of censorship, oppression, and also highlight the wonderful ways of people that have been erased because of who they are, such as, um, she will be talking about um, some of the work. And in the case of Janet Toro, Janet Toro is one of the youngest artists in the exhibition. And it's wonderful because actually we found her through another artist from Guatemala that shares, again, another really brutal history of violence, who is a lot younger, is several generations younger than Janet. And again, um, it's interesting that Janet started as a painter and then moved powerfully into, the, into working with the body. And it makes a lot of sense because a lot of her work has to do with this kind of ongoing history and especially particularly the history of dictatorship that touched her very deeply in a very personal way since very early on. She moved to Germany in 1999 and she continued to produce her work also in relation to the violence and experiences that she had actually had in Chile and returned to uh, Chile in 2014 as has actually reconnected to her, her practice in Chile. Something challenging, especially because as we know, so many of these artists have been sort of erased and not been part of the art scene. Even probably she would have been in Chile. So this is um, a struggle that so many of the women share. So we're going to begin with Barbara. The thing is we're going to do now is we're going to, each one of them are going to talk a little bit about sort of crucial works in their career and then we're going to establish some conversations towards the end. But for me it's important that you actually see them a little bit broader from the pieces that are simply in the exhibition. Janet doesn't speak English, so we're going to do consecutive translation. Well, um, I just want to say I'm incredibly honored to be in this exhibit with all these wonderful uh, artists from so many places. Um, and I just feel I'm so grateful to Cecilia and to, um, um, uh, where is she? <laughs> Andrea, because it just was an enormous amount of work and I just feel very privileged to be in it. Um, so I'll start off like when I, I first started. Uh, the word Chicano is not... Um, I have to say this first, um, the word Chicano uh, is, is a negative term to our parents. You know, most, I mean, my, it's sort of like a, they think it's a negation of our Mexicanness. That's what my, one of my aunts said to me. But it's actually a political term. It was an affirmation of, of, uh, of, of our Mexicanness, actually, and, um, but also it was a, a word of empowerment because we belong to a movement, a Chicano movement, which was spearheaded by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta of the United Farm Workers but also the walkouts that preceded me. I, I was 12 years old when the walkouts were happening in the schools, LA schools in LA. But um, I, I became involved um, on the campus of UCLA. I met Cesar Chavez in 1976, and I heard him speak, and I was just so, I went to Catholic school for nine years, so I have to say that I heard the Catholic in him, you know, get, uh, dedicating his entire life to um, improving the lives of the most exploited workers in America, which are farm workers. So. Um, I, when I was a student at UCLA, I was also very conscious of the fact that um, there, were ver there was not a single female editor of the Chicano newspaper on campus until I became the first one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I did this piece, it's a lithograph, it's in the ex exhibit, which I'm very happy to say. Um, I did it, if you could read the text, um, wall text right next to the, to the work, but um, my brother, uh, said to his wife, his pregnant wife, that she, she couldn't go to college, that she had to stay home and raise that baby. 
And I said, oh my God, uh, I, do we have the same mother? Because our mom was a professional bowler. But she was raised by the champion bowler in Mexico. So uh, Dolores Rico. So, <laughs> I, you know, anyway, but I, when I did this drawing, it was a, a, a lithograph, which is a very complex um, printing process. And I printed it on several different types of paper, rice paper. This one in the, the exhibit has, is on rice paper. But I did uh, fluorescent pink for my brother. So, and we just, um, and then I did this also while I was a student. Both these pieces were done while I was in my last year at UCLA, 1978. Um, and then uh, I worked, I, after uh, I graduated from there, I, I uh, became involved with a public art center, which was a collective of Chicano artists, really great artists actually, the late Carlos Amaras and John Valadez and several others. And um, uh, anyway, and so I, we started a public art um, magazine, which is Chismarete, you know, it says, it, says uh, it was just involving a lot of political uh, commentary by different writers and poets and artists. So I was the first female editor of this magazine too. So. And then this is a 16 by 80 foot mural that I painted in 1981 uh, with the help of a lot of artists in the community, a lot of young people. So that's why I'm really happy to see all the young people here today. But, but when, back then, the city had asked me to eliminate some of the scenes that they felt were uh, negative or uh, reflecting negatively on certain communities. And um, I, I, I should have had like, um, um, this is a close up, that it's, it's so huge, but um, they, the, one of the scenes was a Japanese internment scene and they, they had said um, the Japanese don't want to be reminded of the internment camps. <laughs> and I thought that was funny. I said, well, none of you are Japanese, let's go ask them. So, you know, that's what I did. I went and got really great letters of support. I wish I could, uh, I should have brought a, a, a copy of one of the letters of support from the Japanese community. There were three major um, organizations, um, the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations wrote one of the most beautiful letters um, saying that, the, that it has to be in the mural because it's uh, a constant reminder that it should, this, this should never be repeated. And we're kind of in danger right now, something like that happening. Um, so, I, and then I, I, my mural, since it was censored, I did this piece um, that's in the, also in the ex exhibition um, about censorship, and so that's, that's supposed to be me right there, painting with the spirit of cicadas in the background. And because I felt like the, the Mexican murals were very um, instrumental in inspiring a lot of us. At UCLA, we never heard about those painters, of course. Uh, the, it was Botticelli and Leonardo da Vinci and all that, but I had to go and seek those um, artists out in the Chicano Studies Library on campus. So, let's see. And this, um, I started doing portraits of really strong women like Dolores Huerta, who, I consider one a very strong feminist. Um, Dolores, I don't know if anybody has seen the documentary on Dolores, but it, um, it just talks about her entire life, and I'm in the documentary, briefly, um, but I, I'm the only one that uses profanity <laughs> in the movie, because um, she disclosed that she was um, in a national magazine called Us Magazine. I don't know if they still have that magazine, but it was a national um, magazine, and she, um, was interviewed in that and, and said, um, and talked about the sexism in the union. And um, needless to say, Cesar Chavez didn't like that very much. But I, she, when she called me up and told me, I said, oh my God, shit's gonna hit the fan. <laughs> and that, so that's in the film, you know. I, I just, you know, a three hour interview and they, they select that, you know. So then this is uh, called Primas. This is my, my daughter and her cousin. And I just I started doing really um, focusing on young people because of my daughter. She's now 23, but she has a different way of, of expressing herself as a young feminist. She has gone on so many marches with me and, and, active, and, and so she you know, knows Dolores really well. Dolores sleeps in her room. She comes into LA and she says, does she have to stay in my room again? And you know, it, it's really funny. She didn't realize, when, now she realizes how important uh, Dolores is to all of us, but the, at the time she didn't. So um, let me see. Um, and this is uh, my really good friend, um, Isabel um, Castro, who's in the exhibition too. She, she, is, she also, through her photography, has documented um, women in the community, and she's uh, very much a feminist and um, has been a real supporter of my work and vice versa. We, we are very supportive of one another. We came to, to Brooklyn together, and so um, I just um, wanted to show you her work. I think she's really great.
And this is from a series, uh, Women Under Fire, which is in the exhibit. So, thank you. Thank you very much. It's actually, um, thank you, Barbara. Um, I love that Barbara includes Isabel Castro here. It's a kind of great sign of solidarity because Isabel Castro, the works that are in the show that she showed are about um, making visible the issue that the Chicana Latina women were being sterilized without their consent is a huge tragedy that happened during the 1970s in the US. So, um, so now we're going to uh, move on to Janet Toro. Janet Toro is also going to talk about some of her works. I'm going to be um, kind of do it to consecutive translation. We're going to move as fast as possible, but is it important that we understand a little bit what her work has been about? Primero que nada, hola a todos. Gracias por estar acá. Vamos a partir con la performance La Sangre del Río y el Cuerpo que realicé en el río Mapocho de Santiago, un río que cruza Santiago de oriente a poniente. Okay. This is a piece that she is, is going to talk about, which is about the río Mapocho. Ma Mapocho, which crosses the city of Santiago de Chile, which is the capital of Chile from the east to the west. Aquí hago un paralelo entre el territorio y mi cuerpo. She does a parallel between her ter the territory and her own body. Y la sangre y el río. And blood and the river. Estoy hablando de la sangre derramada por la violencia de Estado. And she's talking about the blood that has been spilled through the violence of state. No tengo tiempo de filosofar, así que vamos a seguir rápidamente. <laughs> Esta es una serie muy grande de 90 performances e instalaciones. This is a very large series of 90 installations and performances. Realizadas en la segunda Bienal de Arte Joven del Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes. Done in the Museo, in the Bienal de Arte Joven of Young Art at the Museo de Bellas Artes in Santiago. Para esta serie me basé en una investigación donde llegué a sintetizar 62 metros de tortura utilizados sistemáticamente durante la dictadura. So this is the result of a very intense research that she did where she analyzes and she integrates 62 methods of torture that she found out that were used during the time of the dictatorship in Chile. Lamentablemente, son métodos que se siguen usando hoy en todo el mundo, también aquí. Regretfully, these are methods of torture that are still being used everywhere in the world, even in the States, some of them. Y lo que hago con mínimos elementos, ¿no? con harina, con alambres, con tiza, llegar a extremos, como es en este caso la Performance 17. So what she does is with minimal elements, like such as flour, String, cuerda, alambres, um, alambre tiza, wire, chalk. and chalk, and then so the slowly to kind of create the kind of extreme situations of. Um, en esta performance, eh, tapo con harina eh, los orificios de mi cara hasta casi asfixiarme, hasta llegar al límite. So with this performance, she actually covers her face with flour, every single orifice of her face and her body to the point where she nearly asphyxiates herself, taking the body really to the limit. Saltamos muchas performances, vamos a la performa 19. This is a performance number 19, so there are all many performances in between. Aquí uh, es una acción emblemática también del trabajo. Voy caminando descalza por la ciudad de Santiago, visitando estos lugares de torturas, desde el museo y también desde esos lugares hacia el museo, caminando con un signo de bloqueo del cuerpo. So what she did is she actually uh, did this experience where she takes her shoes off and she walks from the museum, moving by all these places where torture was taking place and then walk back uh, to the museum. Esta es la performance 57. This is performance number 57. Aquí aludo a las violaciones. It, the allusion is to rape. Lo que hago es abrir mis piernas y mostrar mi sexo al público. There she opens her legs and shows her sex to the public. Y luego lo cubro con harina y con uno de los fragmentos del lienzo que estaba usando. And then she covers it 
with flower and some, one of the courses that she's actually using in the performance. Luego un gran salto, emigro a Alemania. Then as the big jump is that she actually emigrated to Germany. Realizó va varias obras. She does several works. Esta es una serie eh, eh, que realizo al interior de mi casa. She does this in the, in, in actually in her own home. Tematizo lo público y lo privado. The theme is the relationship between the public and the Porque private. Porque puede entrar cualquier persona. Because any person could actually enter the space. Esta instalación se llama isolación, o sea, aislación. Isolation is the name of the work. Y lo que hago es envolver cada objeto que me pertenece. And she wraps every single object that belongs to her. Con capas y capas de plástico. With, with layers and layers of plastic. Hasta que el objeto pierde su función. Until the point where the object loses its function. Yo viví en esta instalación dos meses. She lived within this installation during two months. Cada vez que necesitaba algo tenía que desenvolverlo. Each time that she needed to use one of the objects, she needed to unwrap it. Luego volver a envolverlo cuando dejaba de usarlo. And then wrap it again when she stopped using it. Obviamente estoy tratando el tema del plástico. Consumimos un billón de bolsas de plástico en el mundo. Cada She's vez. dealing here with the issue of plastic. We consume how many billions? Un billón. One billion of uh, the weight of tons of plastic a year. Bolsas de plástico. Yeah. Rápidamente, otra serie grande de siete performance e instalaciones. Another series of seven performances and installations. Eh, en este caso es Carmín. Carmín is the name. Eh, tematizo la trata de personas. She deals with the issue of the human trafficking que es una forma de violencia, Which is a form of violence. el 80% de los que sufren este tipo de esclavitud moderna son niñas y mujeres. 80% of people that suffer human trafficking and slavery are girls and women. Lo que hago es pintarme los labios She paints her lips. y paso mil papeles por mi boca She passes a thousand papers over her mouth. Esto duró más de siete horas sin parar. It lasted seven hours without stopping. Ya. Tenemos que apurarnos. Parar. Bueno. No, no, un poquito más, pero ahora. Ya sí. Esta es otra de la serie que se llama Device en Stunde, las horas blancas, donde dibujo una línea que es la línea del horizonte, del pulso. This is a piece where she draws the lines of the Of the, of the horizon. También la línea del horizonte añorado de los refugiados. The line of horizon related to the refugees. De los refugiados. The, of the refugees, yes. No. Dura 24 horas de forma ininterrumpida. It lasts for 24 hours in an uninterrupted manner. Y son más de 4,000 dibujos. And it's more than 44,000 drawings. Este es Azogue donde introduzco la página del diario Mercurio en mi vagina. This is a soga, which I don't know exactly how to translate this word. It's like a beat or something like that. A soga. Well, where she introduces inside her vagina one page of the, di of the newspaper Mercurio. El diario Mercurio como eh, elemento emblemático de los poderes fácticos. Fácticos? Fácticos. Fácticos. Oh, yeah, which, which as a, you know, the newspaper stands for the, um, an example of the supposed factual uh, um, recordings. Este es un útero invertido que no da luz, sino que devuelve el objeto a las sombras. This is an inverted uterus, and instead of giving birth, it actually brings the shadow into things. Sí. Bueno, no hay tiempo, ¿no? Mm -hmm. No, pero habla de la, ¿Sí? la última. No, no, vamos a dejar esta, Oops. que es otra, y la última, yeah. que es... Uh, esta es la, uh, la última performance que hice el año pasado. This performance was, she did it last year. No. Eh, aquí, eh, un momento. Y rumbo con esta línea horizontal en el frontis del Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Santiago. She does this horizontal line on the, on the, on the facade of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santiago. Con la frase, este es mi cuerpo. With the phrase, this is my body. Como una señal del apoderamiento del cuerpo como un estado de conciencia y de desobediencia. With a sign as a, the body a form of empowering and also disobedience. 
en medio de una sociedad que cuestiona la soberanía del cuerpo femenino y le impone la sumisión. Yeah, in the midst, in, in the context of a society that submits the body and submit el cuerpo. Yeah, that submits, it creates submission in the body. Eso es todo, gracias. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So we have a few minutes just to kind of establish some sort of bridge between these two practices. For me, what is actually powerful, and we have two very strong forms of activism, forms of political art. So if I think of uh, Barbara kind of marching and painting banners for the civil, you know, for the civil rights movement, for the Chicano movement, and I think of Janet, you know, putting her body outside and still today talking about this, uh, these wounds that have not been healed. And these are all stories that have not been resolved. If we think today with the Trump era, sorry, we have to put a name to this, uh, we know that this country is incredibly still racist and we have, you know, all these things that were fought during the civil rights movement, the Chicano movement, they're still completely back in the forefront. It seems that we have not progressed anything. So, and one of the things I wanted to bring now is this idea that there is this bridge in this practice, but also this sense of this con ongoing history of artistic practice. So what I would like to actually ask Barbara is how does she view today in perspective, looking back into your first early works in the early 80s and your activist practice and your practice today and your position in front of society. So to think back of this idea of radicality into this moment in time. Well, uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's been a, a, a lot of um, um, improvements as far as uh, institutions taking Chicano art seriously. Just recently, the Pacific Standard Time through the Getty Initiative had several art exhibits all throughout the city um, exhibiting Chicano and Latino artists, and not a single institution has purchased any Chicano art. <laughs> so um, on, on that level, I just feel like we're still uh, marginalized in, uh, to a certain degree, and I think um, I, I like the fact that, um, that some of the uh, Curators, like especially where there was one exhibit I was in where, where all there was eight of us censored artists, or all our murals were censored. The curators um, from the national, oh, what was the, actually the California, um, um, God, I'm losing it, California uh, uh, Historical Society, they co founded this, this um, co, co curated this exhibit. And, and Jessica Howe from that organization said that. that she was hoping that one day that they would take seriously the work of Chicano artists, you know, to the degree that they would actually purchase the work and, and, and talk about the work, and it's just not happening yet. <laughs> it's just unfortunate, you know. And I completely agree. I mean, for me, uh, Chicano Latino art is possibly the most urgent arena of the art system that we have. We need to understand, we need to give visibility to the issues and to the art practices so we understand a little bit better why the sort of struggles we need to continue fighting, why Latinas and Chicanos and Latin American and all these issues of migration, we are who we are. This is America, isn't it? So I'm going to move on to Janet very quickly. So te lo voy a preguntar en español y después te pregunto. También es un poco la idea de cómo este, tú empezaste en ese momento, en los comienzos de los 80s, y cómo ves tu práctica y esta idea de regresar y continuar explorando esta idea de la violencia del pasado in the present. I'm going to quickly translate what I've actually asked her. I asked a similar question to Barbara, which is this idea, you know, she started in the early 80s as a very young person, and now she returns to Chile, and how, so why does she need to continue exploring this continued idea of um, history of violence, not only in the past, but into the present? Primero, pienso con pena que la violencia no es del pasado, La violencia sigue presente. Yeah, firstly, I think with a lot of sorrow, the violence is not a matter of the past, but is a, is a matter of present. Pienso que ha habido un cambio que es prácticamente visual. Pasamos de una violencia corporal al cuerpo. We pass from a violence of the body to a una violencia social y económica. To a violent, social and economic violence. Pienso que la realidad sigue siendo extrema. I think that reality continues to be extreme. Yeah. Y uso mi cuerpo para eh, accionar con esa realidad. And I use my body to actually activate this reality and make it uh, visible. 
Yeah. So one last quick question, because I know we are arriving at the end. I would like to ask you, because you know you talk about the fact that you know the Chicano art is still not really kind of taken. How was your practice as an artist in your period of time in the 70s and 80s? How will, were you? Were you part of an art scene? Were you respected? Did you struggle as an artist in a very patriarchal <laughs> system at the time? Um, yeah, it was, it was difficult because um, even when I work with Cesar Chavez, the, the staff, a lot of times they would um, question my ability to paint hu huge uh, mural banners. You know, there was always that constant like questioning. And um, when my work was shown here at Times Square in 1989, it was a, a, a computer generated um, image about pesticides and farm workers. I, I was one of uh, 12 artists selected for uh, each month of that year in 89. So um, Cesar Chavez was here promoting Great Boycott Week with Mayor Dinkins and all that. And I remember I was standing in front of the Spectacolor light board and Cesar said, he says to me, are you sure it's gonna really um, be played here? And I go, you would, you would not ask that if I was a man. You know, I, I mean, I remember saying that to him because he, he was surprised. And then when he saw the actual animation, it was, it was, uh, he was very happy. You know, so it's it's just every every as great as he was, there was still that kind of um, sexism, underlying sexism. And Dolores Huerta, that's why I admired her so much because she was able to to really um, work with him closely and trying to change his mind about a lot of things. And in the end, he really respected her. But it's just a constant struggle. I, I worked in art collectives where the same thing. Um, a lot of the artists were really great, but they would also do the same thing. Well, that might be difficult for you, or you know, those kind of comments. And or, or when I was really, really young, they'd say um, things like, well, "Why don't you do smaller works? You know, why don't you? You know, it's it's too because it was physically demanding to do the large scale works." And um, but it was just that it was always a. Uh, and then I was known for being a, a you know, the, I think the LA Times had a photograph of me that said the artist is known for her stormy temper and iron will. <laughs> So I kind of I kind of own it now, you know. I mean, it was <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask one last question to Janet very quickly. And uh, so, Janet, lo que quisiera es hablar un poco de las dificultades que has tenido como artista de ser aceptada en el medio, de ser tomada en serio. ¿Cómo ha sido tu recepción en Chile ahora? So I'm asking her because I know a little bit about this history. What are the difficulties that Janet has had to do her work, to be received, to actually do it physically, to have the space and the voice? Eh, voy a responder muy sinceramente. She's going to respond in a very sincere way. Eh, ha sido muy difícil, he sido golpeada. It's been very difficult, she's even been mm, hit physically, He sido beaten. Eh, eh, saboteada. She's been sabotaged. Eh, he sido eh, burlada por hacer lo que hago, por hacer arte. She's been teased and ridiculed for what she does. Pero nada me detendrá but nothing will ever stop her. <laughs> eh, estoy muy agradecida a Cecilia y Andrea porque ellas me sacaron de la oscuridad. She is grateful to Andrea and to myself because she feels that we have removed, taken her out of darkness. Porque en Chile, todos los curadores, quizás por mi trabajo, me ignoran. Uh, and because in Chile, all the curators, because of her, were actually ignore her. Sí, el trabajo es muy difícil, pero soy una guerrera. Work is hard, but I'm a warrior. Sí, listo. Creo que terminamos. Okay, thank you so much. We need to keep up with it. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Janet. Great admiration for both of you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jorge Badillo, and I am part of the Brooklyn Museum's Apprentice Program. Over the summer, the Museum Apprentice will have the amazing privilege to teach summer camp groups from our collection, as well as our new wonderful exhibit, which we are all here to celebrate today, Radical Women, Land, American Art, 1960 through 1985. Being a Mexican immigrant myself, it is an honor to introduce two amazing Latina artists who are part of this amazing exhibit. Originally from Villa Hermosa, Mexico, Yolanda Andrade 
would relocate all the way to Rochester, New York, where she would study photography at the Visual Studies Workshop in 1976 and 1977. When returning to Mexico, she started her career as a still photographer for movie companies. However, during her time in the United States, Andrade became more familiar with and influenced with the work of street photographers. As a result, she began documenting everyday life and popular culture on the streets of Mexico City. She has won many accolades, including a Guggenheim Fellowship for Creative Arts in 2005. And since 1992, Andrade has taught photography at the Escuela de Fotografía Nacho López, Centro de la Imagen in Mexico City, and Instituto Tecnológico in Monterrey, Mexico. She is joined in conversation today with another incredible artist, Catalina Barra. Barra is a Chilean collage artist born in Santiago, Chile, whose career began in Germany, where she lived from 1963 to 1972. There she began, mix, she began making mixed media works inspired by the artists of the Dada movement. Um, her career continued in New York City, Argentina, and back to her home of Chile. Her work addresses political issues throughout her career. She uses her art and voice to highlight problematic reportings censorship and government terror and focused on the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet in the 1970s. In the United States, she has made works addressing capitalism and military interventionism. She is involved in El Museo del Barrio and is the recipient of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Yolanda Andrade and Catalina Parra in conversation with Carmen Ermo, Assistant Curator Elizabeth Ace Sackler Center of, for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. First of all, um, thank you, Jorge, for the great introduction. It's a great honor for me to be here with Yolanda and Catalina. And I'd also like to mention Marcela Guerrero. I don't know if she's still in the audience, but uh, in my intro, there she is. My intro earlier, I neglected to mention her name, so I need to say her name. She also put tremendous effort into um, Radical Women when she was at the Hammer Museum, and now she's at the Whitney here in New York. Um, so New York's lucky to have Marcela, and thank you for your work on the show. And also, a special thanks to the audience, because I hear it's really nice out, um, but we're getting light from within and from all these brilliant minds. Um, so. Catalina, my first question is for you. Your artwork in Radical Women uh, was made at a time when your fellow artists were being tortured and surveilled for their overtly political work. In Bunches, which we'll see up here, is a series that comes from a Mapuche myth, and we can read its political overtones today, and they're explained in the exhibition. How did you make these works with censorship in mind? And how did you use images and certain techniques like sewing to protect your political message, but also your personal safety. I made these artworks at a time when being openly affiliated to a political party was a dangerous thing to do. Other artists had affiliated with the party being overthrown and were identified as agitators and placed under surveillance. The intent behind the construction of my artworks was to register in a visual manner what was occurring. I sought to represent the torture, fear, and terror, and manifest the political moment that we were living. The military dictatorship closed and censured the press, and most media outlets were permanently shut down. El Mercurio, that is the main newspaper in Chile, a right wing, was allowed to operate and became the main news feed for the military message. I elected to use El Mercurio as craft material in many artworks that told things biographically. The particular sculpture exhibited here in Radical Woman, Diario de Vida, is a sculpture that deals directly with the subject of censorship. The press, real information, and what today we refer to as fake news are displayed and questioned. By using techniques like sewing, like breaking, like tearing apart and mending, I was intervening the artworks. These were actions taking place in the artworks themselves. Sewing has always been identified as a female activity of no descent, so I was using a technique that represented no apparent threat unless you could understand conceptual art. This piece here uh, in 
Sanchez, un punche gigante, that is a pity that there was no space in the museum for this piece that was shown at the Hame Museum. I was told that there was no space. Unfortunately, we had smaller gallery space for this incredible show. Yeah, and this is a piece that was done in 1977, and it's a, a, the body of a woman that has been tortured and mutilated. And you can see that this is a word that was meaningful then and is meaningful today. Absolutely, thank you. Yolanda, my next question is for you. Yes. Your work in Radical Women captures the lively life of LGBTQ or queer individuals in Mexico City. Yes. Um, in this case, in black and white documentary photography or street photography. Why did you use this journalistic style? How did your practice change as you traveled? And uh, to just tell us about these images. I hope you've seen that this is the image that sort of welcomes people off the elevator and okay. people, it's already a selfie spot. <laughs> uh, I went to Rochester to study photography, so my first uh, influences were the photographers that work on their, the gender of uh, street photography, uh, with uh, maybe with a kind of uh, journalistic point of view, like uh, uh, Robert Frank and Lee Friedlanders. Those were the first photographers that influenced my photography, and they still, I think that they still influence me, as well as my teacher, who was uh, Nathan Lyons, that also worked in the same uh, uh, way. Uh, not only, uh, it could be journalistic style, but it is more uh, a, a, a personal point of view that uh, we put into these photographs. And where were you showing these photographs at the time? Excuse me? Where were you showing the photographs? Where were I was, they in galleries? Were you sharing them in books? Or? Well, uh, uh, when I came back to Mexico City after uh, attending a school, I came back in 1977. Uh, there was uh, a starting a big movement in photography in Mexico City. And so I started to participate in all the activities that uh, were being uh, uh, Planted. So I started, I, I cannot say I had a, a difficult time to get into the photography movement at that moment yeah. because it was uh, open to everybody, both uh, women and men and uh, people of, of all ages. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that uh, I have been, uh, I have testified uh, uh, how other women who work in painting, sculpture, in other media, they really have a hard time in Mexico, but not, not really in photography. That's great, so you felt that even though in many cases the images show, in this case, a gay march celebration, um, gay, lesbian, and transgender activists in the street, yes. um, you felt that there was still a chance to get these images seen. Yeah, this uh, uh, particular photographs, uh, which are in the exhibition, uh, belong to that series. But I have also a work in other series like the Image of Death in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, also uh, social and political situations, also about women uh, problems. And uh, from that personal point of view I was talking about. Great, thank you. Uh, my next question is for both of you. Um, today, and I know there's a lot of activists in the audience today, but we really rely on social media and direct messaging to update us on political activity, cabinet appointments, police killings, and I'm curious in your experiences where the cities that you are based in and these challenging political times that you were facing, how did you get your news? What were sort of the relationships that you were experiencing as, as dealing and living in these times? and my father were both academics who worked in the same university and our circle of friends were intellectuals, filmmakers, writers. In 1973, when the coup d'etat occurred, many intellectuals went hiding underground. Colleagues found political asylum in foreign embassies. Because of the fear of being associated with the Socialist Party, People accuse others in an effort to protect themselves and to gain sympathy with the military control. You could only trust those people who you knew closely, and the information conveys through those underground channels. 
you could only obtain real news and trustworthy information through the tightly knitted community. We created and reunited among ourselves with the intellectual purpose of recording and reviewing the events at large and produce work that later could serve a historical documentation of the events in our society. The, Catalina, the people that you're speaking of in this community, um, were they also visual artists or who else were the kind of political minds? They were but basically students and artists, another artist, yeah. So it really came from like students and young people as well. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. And, and uh, Yolanda, do you have thoughts about how you sort of experienced the the moments that you were you were documenting in your photography? Yes, of course. Every moment that I have lived in Mexico as a photographer has uh, uh, an echo in my in my work. Like I could mention, I can mention uh, the years of 1994 on that we had many political. Uh, problems going on in Mexico, like uh, one of the uh, candidates to the presidency was killed in Tijuana, Baja California, so other politicians also were killed, and then it came the uh, movement of Zapatistas in the south of Mexico, in uh, Chiapas, so that shows in my photographs too, I mean I respond, I uh, to, to what's going on around me. Uh, especially in that uh, uh, time, I only work in black and white in Mexico City, uh, because in 2003 I started working with uh, digital cameras and uh, I working in color now. Mm -hmm. So some of those themes that I was working in black and white uh, change, uh, kind of change because I'm not working so much in Mexico City as I used to, to do it in black and white, but my work is, has expanded to other uh, thematic themes and to other cities as well. Um, that actually leads me well into my next question for you, uh, Yolanda. This yes. is an image of your piece, El Grito, from 1982, I think from the death series that you just introduced. Yes. Um, and so I'm curious, again, in these times where some of the earlier images were documenting uh, gay and lesbian life, the moment of an AIDS crisis, of course, which was all across the Americas, not just in, in New York as we sort of think about it here. Um, and of course, consistently in both cases, a very patriarchal system. Um, was the studio and was your work, was it a place of retreat, of refuge, or were you kind of using it to get your hands dirty and who were the community that you were working with? Well, I think both. Uh, I work in the streets. I, I don't have a studio. I used to have a, a lab to work, to, to develop my films and, uh, and photographs. And uh, both photography has always been a refuge for me. It has been very important makes me uh, go on living uh, when I have difficult times in my personal life. Uh, I go to photography and that helps me to go on. To sort of um, a more individual portraits from your, uh, from yes, your work. Yes, uh, for instance, this uh, woman was during the Day of the Dead and it's uh, the personification of a, um, a comic strip mm -hmm. called, a political comic strip uh, called uh, La Tetona Mendoza, which means like a, a big, big... Uh, big breasted. Boobs. <laughs> Mendoza. <laughs> so I, I like it because behind her there's another... Uh, uh, another uh, from Mexican uh, comics, mm -hmm. uh, La Bor Borolas, which has a very powerful woman mm -hmm. who was the, the, the main uh, person in the family mm -hmm. because his, uh, her husband was kind of a very little man with not much character. So Borolas represented for many years uh, a powerful woman in Mexican popular culture. So I like it to put both of them, not only because of that, but because the influence I have had uh, in my work uh, from theater and movies and uh, uh, comic strips. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Because you worked in, weren't you also uh, on a film production crew as well? You worked in film initially and then? Uh, well, I didn't work in, uh, I, I was a, um, a still photographer in some films. That was my first work as a photographer to make my living. Not my, it was not my personal work, but right. just but, to make my living. Yeah, because these images are so sort of cinematic and they kind of, like you're explaining to us, it contains so many allegories and narratives. Uh, in but that it one influenced moment. me. What the work I did uh, in the film industry as a, a uh, still photographer was very important also in the developing of my style of working. Yes. So, Catalina, um, I'd like to ask the same question of you um, in terms of what did your studio practice, what role did it play for you in these challenging times of the dictatorship, and how, how did you and the society, friends of movements around you, change and adapt under Pinochet mm -hmm. in Chile? Um, and then how did this compare to um, your life in New York in the 1980s? Mm -hmm. during, the, during the month preceding the coup, a small group of friends and colleagues who were like-minded chose to act as witnesses and created and recorded and actively took a role in the documentation process. Through the production of my artistic practice and the use of my studio, I fulfilled my need to have an active social role and to have a biographical record through the production of my artworks to the traumatic events that were taking place in Chilean society. And life in New York in the 80s was culturally, socially, and intellectually thrilling. The city and the adult community were going through a period of transformation where all minority groups were seeking and being incorporated. There was social and political freedom and a place and community geared to its acceptance and full display. It's so it was a marvelous period. It was the opposite of what was going on in Chile completely. That's amazing, and, and yet, you know, I think in today's moment, a lot of us feel like this show helps push forward the narrative of how you're saying women, marginalized people um, still need to be seen more in museums, so it's an ongoing yeah. um, push. And so my, my next question is a follow-up for you, Catalina. I know for a period you were also working at the New Museum and that you were working with your practice as an artist, uh, sharing that uh, expressive potential with other groups, underserved communities from Harlem and from the Lower East Side who were coming to the museum. How did um, working with them um, teach you? What did you learn from this experience? These communities, communities I taught had no access to the world of art or to visit museums or to the education of art history as part of the social context of their reality. The communities I taught weren't informed or had knowledge of what making art or being an artist meant. Upon venturing into and participating with their own art creations in the classroom setting, these individuals, these students, gain confidence about themselves, gain understanding of the process of making art, and gain connectivity with that art, within that art community. The community was brought together by the artistic process and broke social barriers. And at the beginning, with all these students, when I talk, I try to talk about art, they say, art. They had no respect, they didn't want to know anything about th that because it was too academic and something too far away from their own experiences. But when I started talking to them, asking questions about their real life, like these pregnant teenagers, uh, how did they feel when they knew that they were pregnant, uh, they immediately open up and start talking how difficult it was to inform their parents, how difficult it was to, to, to realize that they were going to be mad, et cetera, et cetera. So they started working about those themes. Where everything that was relevant in their lives, they could talk about. And then they realized that that was what art meant. I mean, to be able to give their own experiences and work about that. It must have been so amazing for them to learn from you. I mean, right now at the Brooklyn Museum as we're opening the show, really thinking about how are we going to give tours of this massive exhibition? Um, how are you going to sort of select who to talk about, what stories to draw out? And there are so many texts on the wall. Of course, there's the catalog. And what's just been so illuminating for me is just how many stories, and you're saying that for you, that connection for these um, you know, young people who are not necessarily ready for art, but those stories and those narratives that draw draw them into the, 
empty that expressive potential. And so I think Radical Women and, and both of your work ends up sort of being just one of that many um, voices, the, the forum, the chorus that Andrea and Cecilia were talking about earlier. Um, so my next question is for you both. Um, how did feminism, um, either as an activist movement or as an idea, impact your life and impact your art? Oops, go back to you. Oh, I think I might be missing a slide, I'm sorry. I think a slide may have dropped off, I so we'll just leave it on. Okay, okay. I'll see that. Um, well, life hasn't been easy. Life hasn't been easy at all, and working, uh, what helped me through my, what has given me balance in my life as an artist has been making art. Mm -hmm. That's what really matters. So, so you're saying feminism doesn't matter, or is it sort of something that you think about, something that is just how you get categorized into certain museum departments? Yeah, I think you just have to keep working, making art. Mm -hmm. That's the only possible way, and we'll see how it works. Well, uh, I think feminism and the LGBT movement have been important in the development of my photography too. Um, and I also can say that uh, I have been a feminist from my early childhood without knowing that there was okay. such a, a movement like feminism. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I was always a rebel in my home I rebel against the way that uh, my cousins were treated or oh, the way I was treated because I was a, a girl. Mm -hmm. uh, so I couldn't have the same freedom to go out mm -hmm. to, because I wanted to do many, many things since I was a child. So uh, I also got very mad uh, by the way or I saw the women, how they were treated, so different from, from men. So I think I started to being a feminist since a very uh, early age without knowing it. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, uh, of course, I started uh, being part of a movement, movement of feminism in Mexico City. Uh, you know, it's so interesting to hear you talk about it coming from your family because I think, you know, a lot of us who consider ourselves activists, it's one thing to sort of call your representative, march in the streets, but sometimes it's those interpersonal family connections that can be so difficult. Yes, I, I, the, uh, early, uh, later I started going to demonstrations uh, and uh, being part of uh, the movement, yeah. yes. My last question yes. um, for you both is also sort of related to activism, um, since I think we wanted to bring uh, both of your voices together to talk about art and politics in the context of this exhibition. So activists today, um, and always, have experienced a really profound impact on their lives, a, sometimes a negative impact, um, where they're experiencing traumas or reliving traumas, um, either that they've experienced or that they're helping other people through. We think about this idea today as a burnout, and that it's connected today with an idea of self-care, of taking a step back and caring for yourself so that you can continue to help others. Um, I want to know, how did you sustain this radical practice? How did you balance these translations of these issues with an attention to your own care? Uh, making art, I think. Yes, making <laughs> art. I know the these, ca these couches keep make keep us feel like we're in a living room, you know? It's mm -hmm. like very, these couches make it very kind of a relaxed living room. <laughs> no microphones needed, but um, continue, sorry. Yeah, yes, they, I have been able to keep the balance just by making art. I don't know if what, what happened to you. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yolanda. Making art uh, makes me go on, as I said mm -hmm. earlier. And uh, in, now more than ever, because in Mexico we are living very difficult times uh, because the violence against women, mm -hmm. because every day there are many women, more than one, more than three, more than five, that are being killed in a very violent way, and nobody does anything. Those deaths just uh, keep being uh, silent, nothing happens. Uh, there's because of the corruption, and uh, because if they get the killers, they don't do anything to them. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that problem 
uh, really, uh, I mean, I really overcome, trying to overcome those uh, news with my work, keep working every day. And uh, well, that's, that's what I do, keep working. Yes. And uh, we all thank you for your work and for being included in this amazing exhibition. So thanks so much. Thank you very much.